<laughs> Righty. Well, let's get started here. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity, and we're broadcasting live today from the NoSQL Now Conference and Expo. We would like to thank you for joining me today's Dataversity webinar, Big Challenges in Data Modeling, Modeling Unstructured Data, Schemaless Design, sponsored today by Couchbase. CA Technologies, the makers of Urban and Sand Hill Consulting. As, and as the series is moderated by our Steam Pant moderator, Karen Lopez. So a couple of points to get us started. A large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For your questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And I'm pleased to introduce to the moderator for this webinar series, Karen Lopez. Karen is the Senior Project Ma Manager and Architect at Info Advisors. She specializes in the practical application of data management principles. Karen is a frequent speaker, blogger, and panelist on the professional data issues. She is a Microsoft SQL Server MVP, specializing in, the, specializing in data modeling and database design. She's an advisor to the DEMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. And she wants you to love your data. And joining her this morning are our three assessed uh, panelists. First, we have Dipti Bokar, the director of product management at Couchbase, where she is responsible for the company's flagship product, Couchbase Service and works with customers and users to understand emerging requirements for low latency, scalable data stores. Dipti has, has technical experience in the database industry, having worked at IBM as a software engineer and development manager for the DB2 server team, and then at Logic as a senior product manager. Opening us this month is Alex, Alex Peak. Alex is passionate about extracting value from data and has been, has been for over 20 years. In the early days, it was with startups, several of them that he has owned. He has worked with larger companies like Iron Mountain, PayPal, and Intuit. He designed and implemented systems for managing data and analyzing it. And in the relational world, he has worked with OTP systems like Oracle and VoltDB, and for data warehouse systems, uh, I'm gonna my tongue getting tied here. <laughs> Vertica. In the non-relational world, he has also worked with Hadoop. Ecosystems, NoSQL databases like Asana, HBase, and MongoDB, and streaming solutions. In the analytical world, he has built systems for marketing segmentation and used machine learning methodologies with tools like R and MATLAB. And certainly not least, please welcome Hamas Lung Hayes. Ham is a senior consultant for Sand Hill Consultants. Over time, Ham has led much of the evolution of the CIA our Irwin product suite and its support education courses. He provided his extensive ex expertise in information, process, and enterprise modeling to numerous major North American corporations and government agencies. He authored articles and delivered presentations to in industry groups on enterprise modeling and its role in improving performance. And the focus of his consulting and teaching has helped enterprises bridge the space between technical modeling and business success. He is also a researcher in modeling using Irwin products to model nonlinear social interactions. So please welcome Karen and our panelists, and with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. It's so great to be sitting across from you <laughs> and next to me. And we still have two more on the phone. And I wanted to also warn my panelists on the phone that we might just sit here and chat here in the room <laughs> and totally forget about you, so you might have to edge in to get your comments. Um, I also wanted to thank Couchbase as a new sponsor um, for this uh, panel. That makes me really happy. And both CA Technologies and Sand Hill Consultants as uh, previous and existing sponsors. It's really important that we have sponsorship from the vendor community for our community of data professionals. And one of the things it says to me is that these vendors are interested in making sure that you have access to people who have great opinions and expertise in these areas. And the way to show the fact that they care about you is by sponsoring these things. We couldn't do it without you. And of course, Tony and Shannon. The our, our fine friends at Dataversity because they make this happen. But I also wanted to thank you, the audience, because I consider you also panelists on this because you have a chat available to you where you can also give your insights and opinions and try to watch those and multitask and do all this. I'm sorry, multi-thread and do all this. And uh, 
If you have a formal question for the panel, please do post it in the Q&A and don't wait for the end. We'll try to grab some of those questions as we go. Also, your comments for those things. As Shannon mentioned, uh, Dee and I are on Twitter and we'll try to watch Twitter if you use that BCD modeling hashtag to see what's going on there. That's also how you, the audience, help be a panelist by sharing the insights you're hearing here with the rest of the Twitterverse. Today's topic is on sort of uh, a NoSQL, schemaless design, modeling for unstructured data, when does it happen, does it happen, and one of the reasons why we have this topic this week is because we're here in San Jose at the NoSQL Now conference, and this is the last day of the conference, so I've been absorbing a lot of stuff and updating my questions as I go. In fact, there's a session going on right now that I'd like to be in on modeling for our database. <laughs> And, and so there's a lot of modeling chat going on this year as opposed to previous years. But what I think it's important is most of us in the audience, I'm guessing that you are data architects or data professionals, um, but you're not a, a DB2 data architect or a SQL Server database designer, not really. You're a data professional and those platforms change. I think it's important that we as data people have a good understanding about all the places where data goes to sleep at night. The technical term is persistence, but I like to think that data is data no matter where it is, and that we have a professional responsibility to understand not just how to persist data in traditional relational technologies, but to understand how it's persisted in these non-relational ones. Also, that we also have a great set of domain knowledge that we can lend to data as it's being consumed. So most of the schemaless or NoSQL design platforms, uh, those models of persisting data, don't do, there's not a lot of modeling done up front, although we're going to talk about that. But understanding what data is, what makes for a valid instance of that data, what makes for good data, what makes for probably wrong data, what makes for valid ways of using data together, that's something that I think data architects have a lot to contribute to. It's just that we're used to providing that expertise as the database is being built instead of as the data is being used, consumed, shared, and analyzed. Uh, I also think that if we continue to ignore our NoSQL or non-relational platforms, we become less and less relevant to our companies and to our companies' customers. I also think there's a lot of myths and mysteries and questions about the roles of data architects and database designers in NoSQL projects, so I want to make sure we talk about those. So having said that, let me jump over the questions. So which of my panelists would like to, in a sound bite, explain what we mean by NoSQL? I think I'll take out of that, uh, Karen. Um, coming from the relational space, uh, moving from DB2 to NoSQL itself, uh, I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, the way we look at NoSQL, it is uh, it is a, the next generation of databases that allows you to store data in not rows and columns, as I would put it. Uh, something that fits um, that that does not have to live in a relational format, uh, but that can be a a document. Uh, it could be uh, stored in a slightly different format, uh, maybe a column family, uh, or maybe even uh, in a graphical structure. And so NoSQL in, in general uh, means many things to many people, but the, the way we really think of it is uh, it is the next generation database uh, for semi-structured, um, unstructured, polystructured data uh, that really doesn't fit well in uh, rows and columns. So. Alex, was that you who wanted to also say something? Yeah, I was. Uh, I was going to sort of give a slightly different viewpoint. Um, so I agree with uh, with what Dipti has said, but I, I'd also say that the emergence of of a lot of these uh, NoSQL databases has been around um, simplifying the model of the relational database in order to gain different optimization. So uh, in, in many of the, the NoSQL databases, uh, there are um, design decisions taken that uh, make certain aspects of them you know, more optimal for particular use cases, but in doing so, they give up the generality of, 
of the traditional relational database. Uh, so, so I sort of not not in uh, class to to what Dipti said, but in, in addition, um, you know, it's really about um, taking a different set of trade-offs, giving up the generality for um, concepts like availability, performance, reliability, so on. To contribute too, um, this is Ham. I think uh, I almost see it as a uh, um, at, a, at a philosophical level as well, that when uh, thing with uh, you know well well structured uh, data design using uh, relational uh, principles for, uh, for for several decades now, it's, it's quite a mature area. But we've we've also seen in with the end of uh, of the internet and it's in tremendous growth in both the quantity of data as well as uh, the accessibility, as um, as Alex pointed out, uh, is one of the one of the problems we're now dealing with. That uh, we really have to take a fresh look at how we uh, design and uh, and manage our our data systems. Um, no SQL to me doesn't mean no structure. Uh, it means that we have to account for new requirements um, in our overall data management. Um, and it's evolving. It's, uh, I think we're uh, people on uh, the path of uh, breaking through some new thought forms um, and some new approaches. It's quite exciting. I want to uh, jump right away and say that uh, in one of the contentious issues, it's just the term NoSQL in general, that it originally uh, came out as really sort of an attack on relational databases. It was NoSQL. We use SQL anymore. And there are some really valid reasons why a solution should be done in a relational database and very valid ones why it just makes sense to put those into to store data in a platform beyond relational. And for someone like me who's been doing relational, building relational systems for decades now, it that just means I'm experienced, not old, is that it, it's hard for me to to think outside of the SQL box, because that's where I live every day. But I definitely see all these valid uses. But I'm still hearing, I come to not just this conference, but other conferences, and I'm still hearing, you know, SQL versus no SQL thing tossed around as it's an either or, and that SQL is broken. And I'll hear things not really from the speakers or the experts, but sort of the myths that go around the development community or the engineering community, which is, you know, SQL doesn't work. So one of the things I've been tweeting at this conference is sort of these throwaway facts that, you know, once a SQL database hits 50 gigs, it just falls down and can't do something. And we know that's not true. We have lots of valid implementations of very large multi-terabyte systems, even petabyte systems implemented where the data is persisted in traditional RDBMSs. Um, but how, what's the best way for a data architect to participate in the conversation about what the right tool to be used, which is the new definition of NoSQL, not only SQL? You know, what's the best way for a, a solutions architect, an enterprise architect, and even a data architect to participate in that discussion? Yeah. The, 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 you know, the underlying elements are just sort of to understand the strengths of each, and to be able to explain the strengths of each. Um, you know, the relational database, uh, you know, still has a, a good place in the world. And uh, you know, I, I worked at uh, PayPal, eBay for a while, and that's one of the largest uh, um, Teradata installations in the world. Uh, many, many petabytes, you know, double-digit petabytes. So there, there's there's nothing about relational that says it can't scale. Um, so you know, sizes not the issue. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of issues which do differentiate, um, and, and as long as you know the data architect can explain those differences, then you see that it's quite a harmonious world of, you know, we've just added more tools to our toolkit. Um, I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, by using, uh, you know, let's just pick an example like Cassandra, because we use that here at uh, Intuit fairly extensively. Um, you know, in a database like Cassandra, you, you get um, 
you know, great economics uh, for performing certain kinds of tasks. Um, so, you know, we can get very large data, very low latency, high availability, you know, great performance, as uh, long as the task fits what Cassandra is good at. Um, and, um, you know, if you step outside of that, then suddenly you know, it's magical anymore. Um, so, so in, in, in explaining, you know, why worlds all coexist and, you know, all we've done is add more tools to the toolkit, it's, it's just about understanding you know, the strengths of each. Yeah, I would I, I validate, that. That with, uh, I'd validate that with the um, understanding what the requirements are for your particular environment. And the, it's it, it just not an either or in, in our minds. It is, as Alex is saying, uh, it's it's a set of tools uh, to tackle a uh, expanding set of requirements with regard to uh, data design and, and data management. Uh, so it is something that I think we need to embrace as let's look at the technology, let's look at the uh, the architecture. Maybe that's an oxymoron. Maybe the architecture of NoSQL. I agree. I think there is architecture to NoSQL. So let's look at that and and just. Embrace it and look at it against the requirements of dealing with as art, architects in our particular environment. So it's a real environment. Go as ahead. I mentioned, uh, you know, the same companies that are they have these large installations of relational databases, particularly the data warehousing side. Uh, the same companies are looking at NoSQL databases. They're the same. They're the same companies that we're talking to for the generation app. Applications. And so the one thing we see is we see NoSQL as something that fits on the side, right? It's, it, is, it's, it probably sits next to a relational database on the OLTP side. We see a lot more uh, interactive applications or OLTP-like applications that are using uh, NoSQL databases like uh, Couchbase and MongoDB. Uh, there's obviously Hadoop on the analytics side, uh, but there are obviously relational databases databases that will continue to be used for certain use cases. And so I think it's extremely use case driven. Uh, we, we see some migrations uh, in cases of for active web scale applications where if you want to reach out to um, uh, a, a user base of 10 million users or 100 million users, uh, perhaps the performance and the scale that you need uh, may not be something that your relational database can provide. And that's one, that's one kind of use Use case. The second use case is completely different applications. Applications with data that's being actually managed is semi-structured, is object-oriented. And so when you are building a, a data aggregation um, platform, for example, uh, for social reasons, let's say you're collecting uh, Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds, linked information, all this is so varied and diverse in terms of the data model, you need a system that is flexible and that can handle it. And that's actually where data modeling fits into NoSQL. Uh, some people might think that, um, oh, if it's, you know, the schema list, if it's, if it's semi-structured, you don't really need to worry about data modeling. But data modeling is actually a very important aspect of, of NoSQL. And the first step that we advise people and developers to think about is actually uh, how do you design your documents, uh, the kind of objects that you would create uh, and represent these documents with, and then what do, where, where do you go from there? So what's, what's the next step from document modeling to staging and then de deployment? So I'm glad that you made that segue there because that's also one of our questions. Is so in most of us when we talk when we think about data modeling and logical and physical data modeling, we're thinking ERDs, traditional modeling tools, and some of the questions that come up is, are there going to be sufficient notations and tools for doing the data modeling I'm talking about? Is not what's the typical file structure of this. Disk, as, which is what traditional data modeling gets closer to by designing tables and columns and rows and indexes and all that stuff. Where does still modeling, where does it fit in a, a NoSQL project? I'd like to take that one if I could because, uh, you know, I've given a few talks on the topic of modeling in the NoSQL world and uh, I use examples like uh, like Cassandra, you know, the column family idea and document data databases like uh, Mongo and Couchbase. Um, I think the, the fundamental difference 
between modeling in the relational world and modeling in the NoSQL world, at least the subset mentioned, is that you know, in the relational world, you, you are modeling the data. Uh, and with the idea that I don't a priori know all the uses that I'm going to make of that data, I'm, I'm modeling in a way that's uh, applicant agnostic. I can use it for new applications at a later time. In the NoSQL world, uh, the modeling is basically uh, very application specific. And what you're really doing, uh, to all intents and purposes, is modeling the answer to a query. Uh, so, for example, as, you, as you're modeling in the Cassandra world, um, you know, what you have to start with is what questions are going to be asked, arrange your data such that it answers the question. Uh, which is rather antithetical to the way that it's done in, in the relational world. So one of the fundamental differences is um, NoSQL databases are typically uh, application-specific, and the whole concept of, of the relational database, you know, this is sort of common dates, great ideas were all about, I'm agnostic, I can, I can use the data in ways I hadn't previously anticipated. A slightly different perspective on that. I think it is application specific in that you need to think about what are the objects, the entities you're modeling. Uh, so you, you know, Karen, you mentioned it's further away from the the database structure on disk. Uh, I completely agree with. That. I we lo look at it as a more logical modeling mm -hmm. exercise where it's closer to the entity these are the objects you're trying to represent. And then based on that, you create structures or um, document just um, rough uh, schemas for those documents, what they might look like. And of course, this doesn't have to be fixed because every document could look different, have different attributes. That's obviously the power of NoSQL. But that's where you would start off. And so it's, in some sense, we think of it, it's, it's closer to an object mapping uh, kind of an exercise where it is about um, uh, completely abstracting the underlying database or so the persistence uh, here uh, with what the application developer or the data architect is building, um, and just thinking about it very logically in terms of entities, representing those in terms of document data, databases, and um, and then data change over time where those documents might evolve. Um, that's where we need more tools. And that's where the existing yeah. tools um, that we have need to be either extended. Um, or uh, new tools need to be built to be able to see how these these schemas are evolving over time. The issue, though, is is that when you design schemas in the NoSQL world, you have to design them around your access patterns um, because you know you don't have the concept of joins, so pre-join, uh, and so some. Some new new join requirement means create some new table, and, and there's a similar issue with aggregations. You typically have to uh, pre-aggregate because you, you know you don't have effective aggregation uh, mechanisms in NoSQL databases either. So, so really, what you have to do is is start from what are my queries and, and model the answers to the queries. Um, in, in the NoSQL world. So it's not an arbitrary, you know, I'll model what data I want to put in. You've got to think about how am I going to ask for the data out, and that will drive the shape of the model far more than, than what I want to store. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things that you notice with NoSQL databases is, is that you will think uh, because of query patterns, uh, you're going to have to have duplicate copies of data because of the different patterns by which you query them. And it's typically up to you, the user, to do that duplication. The database is not going to do that for you. It's ironic <clears throat> that we really have a multiverse here in terms of, of NoSQL. Uh, you know, which, uh, which architecture um, do we really have? There's multiple architectures involved. We, we also are dealing with a finding problem. You know, it's easy to take data and to file it away, and we can file it away in, you know, any of a variety of schema structures. But Alex is really pointing out is uh, how do we find the relevant information that we need, um, you know, when it comes to the time of actually uh, using what we've stored away. And I think that's a, that's a very, very large challenge 
for a um, for, for kind of, of schema. Um, this is this is more architectural than it is implementation. Um, I think NoSQL derived from the need to handle the larger quantities and, and volume of, of information and the unstructured aspects of information. Now it's coming back to we still have to be able to define that, that uh, structure, that architecture, and gee, we just have uh, queries now built into our architecture. Um, you know, rather than basically coming about as a uh, as a result of a relational design. So I agree with what every, everyone has said here, and so this reminds me, as a modeler, of really more how we data model for data warehouse and business intelligence systems, where we've also taken similar changes to how we persist data. So in a data warehouse design, we aggregate data, we optimize the design of the relational database to maximize performance, and we don't know all the questions that are going to be asked, but we try to guess them or at least support the ones we know we're going to get. Um, so it reminds me more of that type of modeling. So I'm wondering if a data house dimensional modeler might be happier modeling for these NoSQL databases than, say, someone myself who tends to stride in transactional processing data integrity constraints, I don't want any flexibility. Not entirely true, but would you have thought? Yeah, it's well, I think it's somewhat worse, though. Keep going. When you look at a star schema and you, you see that, you know, your fact tables and your dimensions on the side, mm -hmm. uh, you would think that, uh, and that's built, that was designed for a data warehouse, right, mm -hmm. that, that kind of schema. In, in a similar sense, the, the, do, the document modeling or the column family modeling that you do for uh, different types of NoSQL databases is is similar. So you think about you know what what are the uh, the objects, what are the uh, the the piece of data that really fit together. So you can think of it as renormalized and, and data warehouses normalized in some sense. Um, and I think that a, a, a data warehouse architect might find it easier uh, to uh, conceptualize this compared with an OLTP architect, where you're just really just looking at uh, tables, uh, rows, columns, right? Orders, customers, users, where you you normalize you you normalize as much as you can. So in, in that, I would agree. I, I think it, it's a better way or closer way to think of it. Um, and and in some sense, given the size of data for that that NoSQL database is stored, um, you could think of them as the warehouses because many of the use cases that some of these uh, that customers are building are aggregation platforms. Yeah. In some sense, it's it's a lighter weight version of a data warehouse. Uh, of course, you have Hadoop and the the big data systems on on the side that do a, a lot more number crunching and and batch processing. But the the OLTP side or uh, OLAP side, I, we actually kind of support both these use cases. We're starting to see a lot more uh, larger data sets than your typical OLTP system would. You know, I, I think the the difference uh, the differences are greater than than perhaps we we might first think. So you think about uh, a typical star schema. Uh, you know, you're still in the realms of, of second normal form, and uh, you know, you're still in the realms of, of joining data. You know, you're joining the dimensions to the fact table. Uh, and you're still in the realm of when I update a dimension, I have relatively few rows to update. Um, whereas if you try and do that in, in say, you know, a column family or document database, you know, you 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 have to pre-join because you don't have the concept of joins, um, and you have to duplicate all the data. So every row, uh, you know, has to contain the the related. Uh, Value of every dimension, so there's huge duplication. So I don't really think that NoSQL databases are very good at all at data warehousing. And you know, you can even go and look at all the all the companies that have huge data, and you'll find that uh, what they use for uh, data warehousing uh, are you know more traditional relational star schema kinds of uh, uh, data warehouses. But I think uh, you know there's a real sweet spot for no SQL databases, but I, I, I do not think that data warehousing is it at all, uh, and I don't think their models are, are similar at all to star schemas. Yeah, and the, the other aspect of uh, no SQL 
um, is uh, an issue in my mind that has to do with maintainability of the data. With the extensive amount of duplication, um, there really is the ability to, in fact, <clears throat> maintain uh, any necessary changes um, in the data consistently across uh, all of those duplications. And I think the data warehouse, that's, a, that's an issue, but it's still a manageable issue because of things like the uh, uh, demand modeling. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things about uh, you know no no SQL databases is, is is that because we denormalize because we've duplicated, then uh, maintaining integrity is an exercise left to the programmer, and we know how good they are. <laughs> and I think one of the big differences, at least, for, and correct me if I'm wrong, I see the use cases for no SQL just like in data warehousing. It's not about updating data. Even though you know some of the NoSQL databases are moving towards ACID or, or you know other ways of being, being more transactional, um, I just think that the discussion point, the decision point, is based on why are you building this data store? I'm just going to be generic that way. Is that it really is more optimizing for the use and mine, mining is probably the wrong word because it means something to a lot of people, but just the use and consumption of data and less about you know, the transactional data. So if I have a billion row table, it's probably equally likely that I'm going to have updates to some fact in, that, in a transactional system to any piece of data in that billion row table. So it's bish. And I might need to have to model it in a way that's kind of more flexible or generalized than I have in the past. All things that would might have me moving towards no SQL. But that it's all, all of these decisions are cost, benefit, and risk decisions that have to do with finding the right tool for the right job. So when I say it's like data warehousing, I don't think it means that no is the only way to do data warehousing or that data warehousing should be done in non-relational things. I'm just thinking the thought process and the architecture process is closer to that. Right. I, think, I think there's a real sweet spot for, for no SQL. Um, you know, and that is, is apart from the the issues that, that we talked about of you know availability, uh, so they've they've done some wonderful things for uh, you know availability, linear scalability at reasonable cost. But you know that where they really seem to shine is is very high ingest rate, and they do that rather cleverly by not trying to update. What they actually do is an append only model, and and you know that is a that is a you know a good architectural model for very high ingest rate. And then finally, because the data is already preformed to answer questions, then they can have you know very low latency, very high uh, throughput ways to answer those questions. So as you give an example, one of the ways we, we use um, uh, Cassandra here at uh, in trade is uh, customer profile. So as as a as a uh, user arrives at an application we want to quickly look up uh, their profile in, in, you know, in terms of uh, preferences, um, and you know, a database like Cassandra is just wonderful for that because you know we can have a huge number of queries. Uh, give me a profile of this user. A perfect use for NoSQL database. It's look up by key, and you know, here's a complex document which describes their profile, and so that it can do that very. Fast, very reliably. So, so they're, they're real sweet spots. But I don't think analytics is the sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, what we see is with most of our customers that I talk to, um, uh, concur expense reporting, for example, or uh, orbits. A lot of their use cases are I call them OLTP-ish <laughs> because <laughs> there is, you know, there is really no, uh, there is lightweight transactionality. It's not. Uh, there is a, a consistency. I think uh, a lot of uh, these use cases um, um, need strong consistency. There's different databases that support different consistency models. Um, but user profile stores uh, that Alex mentioned, send stores, um, uh, metadata uh, stores for large pieces of uh, content, uh, these are some of the, the, the sweet spots for NoSQL databases, uh, particularly where key value access um, is is out of the the access pattern, and so with some cases like Couchbase, you have a built-in cache that allows you to consolidate the caching tier along with the database, and that's what gives you the low latency 
safety as well as the high performance. And some of our systems uh, that we uh, that customers deploy are running hundreds and thousands of operations per second. So uh, it would be very difficult to tune um, a relational database for that use case, particularly for uh, for write scaling. So write scaling is a hard problem in a relational database. Uh, you could use you know Oracle has systems like uh, Rack, for example, where you could start. Uh, but all, again, based on shared disk. Um, so sh true shared nothing architectures really give you uh, some of the scalability and the availability benefits uh, that are harder to achieve with uh, relational databases. But they're possible, aren't they? So, yeah. so let, you know, let's consider VaultDB, for example. Uh, there is a true relational database, uh, shared nothing, scale out, you know, three million transactions per second, and how many of us need more than that. Um, you know, I mean, let's let's not say relational databases cannot do this. Uh, but let's say that there are very uh, very good reasons to use NoSQL databases, and, and uh, you know, sort of economics is is a, is one of those reasons. Mm -hmm. So, how do you feel having heard a lot of all this stuff? How the modelers and data architects are actually should participate in projects where these types of contentious discussions and, and try to find where's the right place to let day sleep at night. Right. Well, the, the first aspect of this is really understanding the, uh, the, the business requirements. I mean, uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, every customer that I talk to uh, has some uh, direct tie with uh, what the business needs are. So if you're looking at an organization that has, uh, you know, lots of transactional requirements, has lots of Security requirements, um, data integrity, things of that nature. Uh, data architect uh, in in dealing with a uh, with a change is going to need to understand those requirements and also what the capabilities are uh, for the various systems. Uh, we've got one customer who's doing agile development for the applications, um, and they've got you know a traditional relational database. Uh, architecture, and uh, right now they're finding that uh, it's an interesting discussion that they're having between need for rapid response to changing business requirements, which is represented by a frequent additions, modifications, or subtractions of columns to uh, to their data architecture, and the need to maintain the integrity uh, and security of their system. Uh, so do no harm to their customers or to uh, you know the, ri the risk equation. Um, so the the approach has got to be one of, of uh, skepticism, knowledge, uh, um, fundamentally uh, working to the nitty gritty. Uh, what is it that we really need to accomplish here, and how do we fit the uh, capabilities of the various systems together? I see a no single solution uh, on this kind of question. It's really going to be that that kind of uh, a process. It's an interesting study Alex, you made about hold on, Alex. So yeah. I just wanted to throw in a thing there for him. Is that it's so a little bit of snark here. Having attended a few demos here this week, I'm wondering if one of the best ways we can help out some of these teams is helping them identify and form good, meaningful names for these different items, app nodes, and everything. I'm seeing an awful lot of stuff like I used to see with database designs in the early 80s where people just picked short and non-unique names for things, as well as, you know, helping people write down, I won't use the word document, what I did that thing was going to mean and what it should be called. And then all the other metadata that right now I can't find, or I'm sure where that would go or whether it would go into these databases, but all the metadata that we would normally keep about any data that's persisted, it's whether it's, PII, whether it's personally identifiable information, what are its security requirements, what it can be used with, what it should never be used with, what it should never be used for. Um, I don't see those, a lot of those discussions in no SQL design world. I'll, I won't even use the word model. And so is that some place where we could contribute? You know, it definitely is. At the core, at the end of the day, uh, when you get down to, you know, names of objects uh, and the definitions or properties of those objects, whether relational or non-relational, uh, without paying attention to some of those core basics in terms of autonomy, naming standards, um, things of that nature. Um, you know, 
system is going to succeed or fail based upon how well the, the atomic level is addressed. So, Alex, yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, a couple of issues. Uh, so, uh, picking up on the on the first phase of, of what Ham was talking about, um, you know, that flexibility of data model is is a very interesting topic, and um, and I think sometimes uh, you know misunderstood in the relational world. So, I'll just give uh, two two examples which sort of operate at ends of the scale. So, when I was uh, working at PayPal, um, we had one table in the in the system that is absolutely hammered constantly all day every day. And the idea of adding a column to that table was almost impossible because the only way to do it was to lock the database for some reasonable period of time and that man can't take payments. So so flexibility of data model in a situation like that is just a wonderful thing. And I think we often forget that you can have flexible models in relational databases. You can actually store name value pairs, guess what, in a relational database. Yeah. So you know, I think we we ought to understand both ends of the issues of flexible data model. Uh, to comment on the, the second phase of what Ham was talking about, you know, I, I think metadata um, is absolutely crucial regardless of, of what kind of data store you have. If you don't know what data you have and what it means and where it is, then your business is not going to go very far. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. And I see a lot of the developers who are embracing these technologies very excited about making data move fast. If that's just sexy, hot, fast, performance demos are always great to see. But the old school data architect, love your data, respect your data, take care of it. I always kind of cringe, and I know these are features of the tool, and I, I embrace those. But just in words like eventual consistency, and you know that makes traditional data people get itchy is what I say, yeah. and it, why we do it. Like, we don't need to have perfect data for all use cases, and we trade that off for something else, right? But what if, if my bank started using eventual consistency, I would have a perfect example right? I always <laughs> use. So I'm, I'm happy with uh, my bank uh, continuing to use strong asset for their transactions. Right. Uh, but there are a lot of other applications, right? There are a lot exactly. of different kinds of content applications in particular, uh, collaborative applications where, uh, where you know, there may be a need for um, eventual consistency. Or have, you know, I was just posting here on the on the chat, uh, eventual, eventual durability. Yeah. So w what we see is that user requirements for these applications vary quite a bit. Um, I've started seeing it as a spectrum. Uh, I think that, so Kashmir is, is, is strongly consistent, but Cassandra, for example, is eventually consistent. Consistent, the ability to have consistent, strong consistency, and you can tune it, right? And it's tunable, yeah. and I think that's where we're actually headed: is a tunable uh, model based on your requirements. Again, it's it's going back to the uh, the application requirements. I think one one thing one thing you'll find though is that many systems that you think are strongly consistent are actually eventually consistent. So you know, you, you talked about banking. Banking is actually an eventually consistent model. Credit card processing is actually an eventually consistent model. They are not acid consistent uh, models. Some of them are, and I totally get. That's why we still think in banking of batch overnight updates and posting dates and all of that stuff. I, what I don't want is the type of eventual consistency where um, different users accessing what appears to them to be the same data set getting drastically different answers. You don't want two tellers sitting next to each other, you know, different account balances for me. So that's a tunability as well. Yeah. So so if you think about the two party transaction, so I send money to you. Yes. Uh, so it's important to record that, you know, I, I have the money available to send. I did send it, and I sent it to you. So those pieces of information are important to to keep a uh, an atomic transaction. But when money actually gets to you, uh, you don't even know I sent it. So it doesn't have to be part of an acid transaction. That can be an eventual consistency. Yeah, but but so, you know, if you design it, the data to be consistent, uh, then that eventual uh, validation 
transaction or completion of the transaction, you've got confidence that the result is correct. But if you have an inconsistent design, uh, that that bad design will never reach consistency. There will have to be some post-transactional reconciliation, which is very expensive. So right. the importance of the metadata design, I think, Alex, you touched on this earlier, you know, we need good metadata design, no matter what the architecture is of our system. Yeah, I think so. Going back to the tunability, right? Uh, we see, uh, and it's not just consistency, right? It's it's AAC ID. It's, yeah, <clears throat> it's all these aspects. Um, we've already had added knobs for each of these because some some um, um, customers are not okay with eventual durability, for example. Right. So you know, but you have availability in different if, different scenarios. For example, if a node goes down. Uh, things that are in memory uh, may not have been persisted to disk, so you lose them, but you have a replica sitting that on the other side. And so people are thinking about durability in, in a different way. Where they might be okay with having a replica for, for a, a persistence. Uh, they are okay with isolation where you need to see your own changes, but you're okay if um, you know, another another uh, agent uh, sees a different view, a, a part of the transaction. Uh, but strong consistency and strong durability are uh, the two requirements that come up in, in, uh, very commonly uh, with our users, particularly with user profiles, for example, right, the yeah. one that we talked about. If I update my preference and I go back to look at my and view that, that change, if I don't see that change there, I'm confused. And so we see that if it's the same user who's made the change, he should be able to see his own change. And that's one of the requirements that's coming up. But over time, we'll see a spectrum of knobs for assets. So we have just under 15 minutes left, and we've got some great questions in the Q&A that I want to make sure we get to. I'd like to get to a lot of them. So if we can keep our responses as efficient, highly high performance as possible, that would be great. Um, just that's a really good observation. I'd really like to know the answer to how do I model NoSQL data. The panel seems to be dealing with platforms and projects, not modeling. So as an architect, I'm interested in exposing metadata about NoSQL databases. So, hey, I'd like you to answer that one really quickly. How are we going to model this data with our current modeling tools and environments? Well, uh, as, as far as, um, you know, what do we need, uh, we need basically to understand that we need to have the data about the data. We need metadata uh, a design that says, uh, you know, what are the um, what objects in the system, what are the properties of those objects, uh, you know, no matter whether it's a, a SQL model or a, non, uh, or a relational model or a SQL model or a relational model. So, um, Fundamentally, without uh, without going beyond that point, uh, that's the first thing uh, we need to have. Um, tools for that now? Do you think? Uh, you can certainly you can use uh, existing relational tools just to build a data dictionary. I mean, really, concepts have been around for a long time in terms of you know accurate depiction of what is it we're trying to do. It's the meaning of the the patterns that we have or the symbols that we have in our system. So a customer means the same thing to everybody within the span or the scope of, of the system of interest uh, that have multiple definitions. These kinds of things that we see consistently not happening properly with, uh, with a lot of customer models is you will get um, zip code. I had one model that had uh, four data types and 11 different definitions of zip code. Uh, this is the kinds of inconsistency in a, uh, in a you know a uh, a risk uh, a risk system will lead to a lot of problems. So fundamentals is go back to the fundamentals. Do the basics, use definitions. Uh, then if you um, you know need your schema, whether it's relational or non-relational, you can to build your architecture from that. Point. Need to keep our answers shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <but that's... laughs> I know. I. I... I'm going to tell Shannon we need two hours for these webinars. <laughs> um, so one of the questions is, if you're modeling for a specific application, would you actually end up crippling your data for other uses? So I think that the answer to this is yes, and that's on purpose. But 
um, I think this is how a traditional architect approaches data modeling. We're thinking about log reusability, but is that necessarily one of the goals, Dipti? So I think, uh, and when reusability, you, um, you're talking about um, multiple applications accessing the same data, right? Yeah, and for multiple reasons. Correct. Reasons. Correct. So I think that um, at the moment, where, while NoSQL databases do not have joins, it's, it's at the moment, right? These are early products in the early in the life cycle, and so we will have we will have some notion of joins across objects in the future. But that doesn't mean you have 100 tables to represent one object. It means that you would have a couple of related objects, um, and, that, and that's the way we think of it. So you would have a, a few key objects, uh, all data about a specific object belongs to one document. Uh, and, and so you still have, you still have the ability to use these uh, data across multiple applications because uh, hopefully the, the, the kind of objects that you're representing are uh, what we call a business normal form, which is actually business objects that can be used across multiple applications. Excellent. Alex, what are the questions we have in here? Is the shift to NoSQL due to um, the end of big data? Because we seem that people can lump all, especially traditional data architects, can think of all these new technologies and platforms and the whole big data growth as being very similar, mostly because they're not about traditional data systems. So where, where do you draw the line and where do those things fit and how do architects think about NoSQL and big data? <laughs> Interesting. So, you know, I think uh, we should separate, you know, the evolution from, you know, what what you have available to you in your toolkit. So, you know, from, from an evolution perspective, how it all started, uh, I think there are very large amounts of data and very high ingest rates, and um, you know the the um, substructured nature of, of data. Uh, all drove the movement towards NoSQL. Um, the the idea of the the huge cost of really large relational databases, commercial relational databases, was was also a motivator. So I think that's what kind of kicked off the the whole thing. But I, I think today, um, you know, what you look at is is you have a toolkit and um, you can do data in relational or unrelational. You can do fast. In relational or non-relational, um, you know, really, what what it's about is is understanding the trade-offs and picking the solution that's most appropriate for your use case. Well, you um, sound like an architect there. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Cost, benefit, and risk. You know, that's the whole thing. So, um, one another great question is: So Wanda said, well, after we do these definitions, now what? Do we do an ERD model? Should the data management profession inclusive here a SQL, no SQL, big data, whatever, appliances, whatever. Should we be developing some different notations or different ways of modeling? Because one of the key factors in modeling is I personally don't do modeling just for the nice pictures and the documentation. I want to be able to do round trip modeling where I can reverse engineer things, forward engineer them compare one version to another, and like, is, is that should be going, or should we be using our current ERD-based tools and handing them over a nice document? Well, think the shape of the data. So the shape of the data is is either uh, somewhat tabular, so think of a, a Cassandra column family, that's basically a, a big flat table, um, or uh, it might be, um, you know, hierarchical document shape. So, you know, thing XML, JSON. So, if you have those two shapes, I think our current tools already deal with those. Uh, and and so, I don't think there's anything special uh, about modeling that requires new tools. Uh, mostly, you know, what, what are these new databases are about are physical implementations. We're well, you know, talking about physical trade-offs. It's the physical side, but the you know the the logical modeling, um, they're familiar models uh, by the tabular or, or, or uh, you know hierarchical document. I don't, know what those, because I don't know what those tools are that I can point to Cassandra and compare it to my logical or my physical ERD based model. 
and be able to say what's different, what's the same. Like the real sort of, you know, being a data modeling tool like an engineering tool, not just a diagramming uh, representation of some business model. Like I want to do both, definitely. But so round trip engineering? We're not there yet. So we're, we're about, close, though. I mean, we've really had, uh, you know, good tools in place now for, uh, you know, num not many years, certainly uh, decades. Uh, <laughs> decades, yeah. And round-trip engineering is it's not so much a limitation of the notation as the, as the technology and also the procedures in which we use. You know, the way we actually conduct data management, I think, is at the core, and how we use things like standards in our processing. Uh, as well as things like oversight, uh, you know, uh, governance, um, you know, quality control, and things of that nature. Uh, this has been well documented for years in courses and books and so forth. So, yep. So all good points. Yeah. So going back to your point about you know how do you run it against uh, Cassandra or Couchbase? Um, that does not exist right now. Exactly. So one, there isn't a common um, language yes. or a common. Um, framework that can be used across line, across databases. Everyone has their own notion of how to do an update, which looks very different. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone has their own notion of metadata. Couchbase does not have any metadata other than uh, databases. That's yeah. There are no tables. There are no, you know, right. th that's pretty much it. And so until you have uh, every, so what I'm getting to is it's early. It is early. I think that modeling tools might exist for your logical um, definitions and, mm -hmm. and modeling. But when you want to relate it directly with the underlying database, that's something that will evolve over time, mm -hmm. and we will actually need to be able to um, do reverse engineering to find what a schema is for, or a common schema across documents is given data that already exists. So you might actually have to do it backwards. Yep. Data to derive the model from the data itself. And that's that a really good point. And I, I, I joke that that's going to be my next startup. <laughs> We'll talk. <laughs> so coming to the end of all this, and I really would like to talk more about this, so maybe we'll have another more focused webinar uh, later in, in in the next year or something like that so that we can continue this discussion. Because I data architects and data modelers to be part of those types of discussions. So I'm going to ask each of my panelists, do you have a short 10-second, one-sentence takeaway that you want everyone so, Ham, I'll start with you. So, I think that the, thank you for the uh, opportunity. I think the we have here is new opportunities to look at uh, you know changes in our uh, you know, problem set, and uh, I think that if we start looking at the, the mesh of relational methodologies and uh, NoSQL methodologies, that we will wind up with some exciting new uh, changes. Good, Alex. Yeah, remember that the broad range of NoSQL solutions are just, you know, new additions to your toolbox. Uh, you still need to model, um, and you know, so metadata uh, and modeling are, are still important. Excellent. Yeah, I would agree. Data modeling is important, no matter what uh, backend persistence mechanism you use. And I think relational data architects have a huge opportunity to actually reuse and, and reinvent themselves. Uh, the concepts remain the same. Uh, it's just that the backends are different. Excellent. I didn't pay any of you to say all that, did I? <laughs> Except to in our champagne here. <laughs> and Shannon. <laughs> so we're coming just up at the end. Um, I really want to thank Couchbase for sponsoring this webinar, for you being here, Dipti. That's so nice to have uh, people from all the communities and all the right, uh, wide ranging uh, technologies, exciting new technologies that are happening. I want to thank CA again as well as being a long term sponsor and Sandhill Consultants as well. And we're all in this together with the trying to figure out where we're all going to fit. Um, I thank Shannon again for being an excellent cat herder for all of us and getting us here and getting the audience there. I wish we could have gotten to all the audience questions because I still consider you, all you audience people part of the panel. And I want to thank Christina for lending us her room so that we could do this. <laughs> and, and my panelists, and Alex, thank you so much for providing your insight. I have attended a few of your talks, and I really appreciate your making 
this type of knowledge. Any data architects out there that get an opportunity to hear him talk about NoSQL implementations and these design considerations, it's definitely worth doing. You know, at EDW, his room was packed, and I, I got one of the last actual seats in the room, so I was very happy about that. And, and Ham, we've known each other for a long time mm -hmm. and have come mm -hmm. through the traditional data, uh, data architecture world, so I'm really glad you can join us. And Shannon, off the top of your head, do you remember what our topic is for next month. Met, you can look that up right away. Um, <laughs> while she's doing that, I should be better prepared here. Um, while she's doing that, I wanted to know that wanted you to know that really soon we'll be turning off the recording for the session, and we're going to stay on as long, probably about another 10 or 15 minutes, so that we can continue some sort of offline discussions about these things. Uh, Karen, and I just want to uh, reiterate what you said, and thanks to Couchbase, and thanks to Say, and thank thanks to Sandhill for sponsoring. You guys are just, I can't do it without you guys, and I uh, just so appreciate it. And I, the uh, next month's talk is data model patterns. Oh, that's, that's October. Oh, I went to October. That October is data model patterns. Okay, so in October, we're talking about data model patterns. <laughs> and September is. Uh, building a stronger team, data modelers and project managers. Oh, excellent! <laughs> that should be good. You guys know some project managers that want to talk data modeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you all. And thanks to everybody for attending today. I will turn off the recording so that we can have our little open discussion uh, off the books. And again, everyone, thank you so much. I love how much you guys interact and, and participate in these sessions. So, is awesome.